He has walked this path before us He is walking with us still Turning tragedy to triumph Turning agony to praise There is blessing in the battle So take heart and stand amazed Hey, I want to welcome you this morning to First Baptist Church of Gardner online, and uh, we're, we're really glad that you're joining with us, and we hope that uh, you'll experience the presence of Christ as we worship together from our own homes today. A um, couple things as we begin, as we do each week, we want to make sure that we uh, take some time to reach out to each other, and so I want to invite you to take a few moments and um, pull that phone out and then send a message, a text, a uh, Make a quick phone call. Check in on somebody today. Let them know that they're loved, that they're missed, and that you hope to see them soon. And then join us again for worship. Once you do that, I want to invite you to put the phones down. Um, maybe pick up a, a, a piece of paper or, or something for your kids to play with and, and uh, be able to kind of keep their hands busy and keep our, our focus on what God is going to do in us as we worship during this time. So uh, before you get all those things, let's take a moment, let's pause the video, let's reach out to somebody and then get prepared to come into the presence of Christ.
Um, I brought something that I was going to show you and see if you wanted to help me out with. I want to build a building, like just a small building. And, and I okay. thought, in case you guys are at church tomorrow, I'll show it to you tomorrow. Or if not, I can wait till next week. Um, just to show you how cool this building is. But I'm going to build it out of, can you see what these are? No. You know what that is? Yummy. An ice cube. Yummy ice cubes. Right? So it's going to be kind of hard to build. I'm going to try and do it here on this on this thing here. Let's see if I can get the screen down. Oh, that isn't working. All right, just kidding. Um, we'll turn it over here. We'll put them on the table, maybe. Don't look at my messy desk. Nobody can see that. Okay. okay. So I've got all these ice cubes, and we're going to build a building. Now, um, what do you think the best way to do that would be? Um, maybe try and do, like, you know how pyramids kind of go, like, they have triangles? Maybe you should do it like a pyramid. Oh, that's a, a good idea. So, like, big on the bottom and get smaller towards the top? Yeah. Okay. Let's try it. So, I will put some, they're a little slippery. I'll yeah. I'll put some on the bottom that are bigger. And here, move some off of here. Do it like your cup stacking. Okay, that's a good idea. Cup Ooh, these are stuck together. That'd work good as the bottom. I'm smart. Okay, and then, so we've got a, I've got a base, kind of, ish. Ish. <laughs> Ish. And then we'll put them on top. Just like a pyramid. Except these are all round and they don't like to sit on top very well. Yeah. Okay. There's my base. Why are my hands getting so wet? Goodness. Okay, so... I'm going to work on building this. Here's what I want to know. Um, can you guys judge it when you come uh, to church? If you come to church tomorrow, can you check this out and tell me um, what you think of it? Are you down for doing that? Yes, I'm good. Do you I'll see do any, that. Do you see any problems with that idea? I'll just leave it right here on my desk, and then you guys can stop by and check it out. It'll melt. Yeah, what? It'll melt. Yeah. It'll what me melt by then. What do you mean? Because it's oh. an ice cube. It's made out of water. What? It's just frozen water. So you're telling me that all this work is really not going to do me any good? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Yes, it is. Well, that's kind of annoying because my hands are cold and wet now. And it's not going to do me any good. Hey, at least. Have you ever done anything that when you were done, you felt like it was all a waste of time? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, me too. To, um, today we're going to talk about that. That there's this, uh, James talks about how uh, sometimes we make plans and we need to quit making plans and instead uh, ask God to show us what he wants from us instead. And I think a lot of times my plans are kind of like building a building an ice foundation. Um, I might think that they're great, but they're not going to last very long, right? They're going to fall apart. Well, I don't even have to wait for them to melt. I can't yeah. even get these things to stay together even if they're solid they keep slipping yeah. and sliding and moving around and nothing seems to work and uh, we're going to learn from James about that and Jesus actually tells a story about that that James is talking about where he tells about a man who had so much wealth so much money which in that case was grain he, he stored up so much grain in his barns that he had way too much and so you know what he did he tore it down and built bigger barns so that he could fill more grain into them. 
And Jesus said in this story, this guy spent all this time working on making sure that he could store everything. And then he died. And how much of that grain goes with him when he dies? All of it. Does it? Do you get to keep all your toys Basically. when you die? No. Nope. Oh, no. It doesn't go with you, does it? And, and so Jesus said he put all that time into building this stuff to protect his money and then ultimately lost his life and didn't get to use it. We're going to talk about how sometimes we spend all of our time making plans instead of just asking God to show us what he wants from us instead. And it's kind of all like building ice cube buildings and leaving them on your desk. They're just not going to last and they're going to get y'all wet. All right, guys. Yeah. That's all we have for today. So I will see you next time. Okay. Let's wave everybody out. Bye. Bye, guys. Good morning. I'll be reading Matthew 6, 25 through 34. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Have you ever made a plan that just didn't go the way you hoped it would? This weekend, uh, we've been working on replacing the sewer line at the Parsonage, and it is a monster job. And so thanks to the help of, uh, of some guys in our church, uh, Chris and Hank Flagell and Rex Pio, they were working machines and digging nine feet into the ground, this huge, you know, 100-foot trench, um, moving dirt, replacing the line, filling it all in. So we've been working all weekend. And at one point, we, uh, we, ha we had to transport some dirt. So we had, had a truck and a big dump trailer um, that we loaded up with dirt, and we took it to where we needed to dump it. We get to the place, and we had, we had, we had set it. And you could tell this was heavy. This was heavier than the rock that we had had uh, loaded and transported this was heavy and we got there and we thought man i hope this thing works started up got to the spot started up the 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 engine that that runs the hydraulics to raise up this dump cart and went to raise it up and nothing we had loaded it so heavily that it wasn't going anywhere and not only that we didn't have any shovels with us. At least we didn't think so. They were all back at the work site. So we decided, do we drive the 10 minutes back, 15 minutes back to the, to the site to, to grab some shovels and then turn around and go all the way back or take some off or something? We, we, we looked around. We found a couple shovels, not ideal for digging, dug a little off the front end. And yeah, after about 10 minutes of manual labor, it was able to go up and dump. But it was one of those times where we just, re we didn't plan for this very well. We didn't load the trailer correctly. We put too much on the front end. We didn't bring shovels just in case. We, we didn't have any other method to get this fixed. And it is a frustrating thing 
when you don't plan. Luckily, the rest of the sewer project was planned out very well and everything went really smoothly. Though there were pl many Plan B moments. A poem by Susie Toronto. Life is all about how you handle Plan B. Plan A is always my first choice. You know, the one where everything works out to be happily ever after. But more often than not, I find myself dealing with the upside-down, inside-out version, where nothing goes as it should. It's at this point that the real test of my character comes in. Do I sink or do I swim? Do I wallow in self-pity and play the victim or simply shift gears and make the best of the situation? The choice is all mine. Life is all about how you handle Plan B. Now think back to about a year ago, right now. About this time when school was starting back up for our kids. And, you know, even those of us that don't have kids in school, the whole world kind of shifts when the fall comes and school begins. You know, so you have kids that are starting in a, a new grade with a new teacher and, and this force of children going back to public schools and private schools and and parents that, you know, that have been home in the summer, teachers that are now going back to, to, uh, to teaching all the time, and everything kind of starts to ramp up. Sports begin to happen, high school football and, and cross country and volleyball. Uh, the chief season, remember a year ago, hopeful that maybe we can make it a little further than that, that championship game we had lost the year before. Hoping for a good season. K-State football, hoping for a good season. KU, hoping to not be embarrassed in football. The Royals by last year, about this time, were already out of, you know, any chance for the playoffs. But we had plans. School was starting, a new year, a new opportunity to, to think about what is to come. And surely things will go as they always have. Seemed fine through Christmas, you know. We get Christmas was great, and and winter was a little mild, and and uh, we celebrated um, that that season of of remembering that God sent His Son to the earth, and and that season of giving to one another, and and lights, and and uh, Christmas trees, and all that good stuff. And then the new year started. We started making plans again. I love January because I can look at it as a blank slate and say, what is the next year going to look like? And, and, uh, and, and dream about what God may do in my family and in our church and in our community. And setting, we begin by setting goals for our church ministry with our teams and, and look at what it is that, that we feel led to do as a, as a church body. We even might have, maybe you, made summer plans for vacation, starting to think about what are we going to do when, the, when it warms back up again? Surely the year will play out just like it always has. And then March hit, and everything shut down. Nobody planned for this at all. Jobs were lost, businesses closed, even church certainly the first time in my lifetime, had to close the building down and go online. We've been doing this series on Little Brother Wisdom by uh, going through the book of James, Jesus' little brother. And he warned us for this. He prepared us for this. He teaches us what do we do when our plans don't work. But before we get to what James says, I want to back up because James is heavily focused on Jesus' teachings. And so I want to back up to something that Jesus said first. In Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13, he told a story, and here's why. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. 
Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be when, with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. So it starts with Jesus in this situation where somebody says, hey, Jesus, tell my brother to share, to give me my half of the inheritance. Give me my half of the money that I didn't earn that I think is due to me. And boy, did they ask the wrong guy. Jesus does not care who gets the money. Instead, he tells this story. He talks about this fool who stores up riches for himself, and he has so much, he doesn't even have room for it all. So instead of doing anything else with it, he tears down what he has, builds everything bigger so that he has all this room to put all this expensive grain, only to die and get none of it, to enjoy none of the wealth that he'd been storing up because in death, none of that goes along with us. And what's interesting is, in the, after this story, the next thing Jesus goes on to talk about is worry. Just as Aaron read for us uh, about worrying about our life, about what will happen to us, about where we will find food and where we will find drink and where we will get clothes and how everything will work out. Jesus prepares us for what James is about to say. In James chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boasting in your arrogant schemes... All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So much of the wisdom of this world is to plan. You know, we learn about we need to save for our retirement. We need to prepare for tomorrow. We need to build our long-term security. The little brother wisdom in, in James chapter 4 is, instead, obey today. Now, James is writing in this moment primarily to uh, merchants whose focus is on building wealth. And so he's talking to people who, this is kind of the lifestyle, the plan that they're, they're having. They're looking at a city and saying, I'm going to go there. I can make this much money there, and I can build that up, and then I can go and do something else. And their wealth gave them the opportunity to plan and to continue to build in the same way that Jesus tells the story about the man who built bigger barns to store his wealth. And ultimately what they're trying to do is to build security. This is one of our culture's greatest idols. And you're not going to want to hear this, but this is one of our culture's greatest idols. And we have largely failed to, to, uh, to go against it even in the church. Security. The idea that we need to be financially comfortable. That we need to also be safe from all harm. That we need to work and plan to get to the point where we don't have to worry about our, our money and where we're going to get the things we need and where we don't have to worry about our safety and if we're going to be okay. These are not kingdom values. Security Comfort, even safety, are not kingdom values, are not things we find in the pages of Scripture for our own good. Doesn't sound practical to say that. But again, as James over and over again, as we've read through these, the, these, uh, these words of James over the last several weeks, what we find is he's speaking to believers and he's saying, what God wants from you is not what the world is doing. The world is doing is focusing on security. What God wants from us is obedience. He pushes us 
to change our focus. If our focus is on the security of our life and our comfort and our safety, then we are missing the point completely because there is nowhere in Scripture that God calls us to comfort or even safety. Instead, he calls us to obedience, to sacrifice, to service. So James pushes us to change that focus. He pushes us to stop making plans, stop building storehouses for my security and my wealth, and instead count the cost. Luke 14, 28 says it this way. Jesus says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. What James is telling us is we have to be aware of what matters. Following Jesus is costly, and so we have to count the cost of following him. And a lot of times that cost is security. It is having everything I want so I never have to worry. It is taking care of myself so I never have to be afraid. None of those things are, are promised. Instead, we are, are called to, to give up those things in, in uh, our act of following Jesus. Now you may say, what about, we see, we see evidence of planning in scripture. We see, we see Joseph when he was elevated to, to a place of power. The whole point was to plan because they were going to have seven years of, of, uh, of great wealth and then seven years of famine and he needed to plan and store up and do all those things that Jesus just told that guy not to do. But what you have to understand is what Joseph was doing was taking care of everybody. The planning was not about his own security and his own safety and his own selfishness. The, the planning was for the sake of the people. And we have become such a self-involved people that we don't plan for the sake of others. We don't count the cost of helping our neighbors. We so often are too busy caught up taking care of of ourselves, building walls, building storehouses for all that we can build for ourselves. James says, stop planning for your security. Instead, count the cost of following Jesus. Second thing he's telling us here, stop looking ahead. Stop spending all of my time looking forward and be present today. I keep looking for this time in the middle of 2020. It's September now. I thought this would be done by now, you know. And I keep looking forward, you know, maybe November we will have a vaccine or maybe January or when will things get back to normal and we don't have to wear these masks everywhere and we can start shaking hands and hugging people again and having conversations and getting back to seeing each other and, you know, not having all these things the way that they are. And I keep looking ahead, trying to just get through what we're going through. But that's not the call. Quit looking ahead. Instead, be present. James lays it out there. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. James calls us to be present. So I tend to think of life in terms of movie clips or tweetable moments. Somehow I've convinced myself they last longer that way. Now my wife, and she proved me wrong when she referred to my phone as my black wife. Now, I thought it was funny. I mean, we both giggled. Now, you single dudes, y'all take notes. Now, I am no expert, but I don't think she was kidding. 
She proceeded to talk about some other stuff which I really don't remember. I was too busy composing this tweet where I'd quote her with some sort of clever hashtag about marriage and about how much I love her to be listening to her right then. And I think what snapped me back in was the silence which indicated I was supposed to have some sort of response to whatever she was saying right there. I told my father that story in hopes to get a little sympathy. My father, civil rights, Vietnam War vet, hopelessly charming on his fourth marriage, father. And rather than the customary nod that men give each other when they understand, he proceeded to explain to me why he failed as my mother's husband. He said it was the same reason half of his platoon died in Vietnam, and the same reason you are deathly afraid of your daughter becoming a teenager, son. You can't hear past the explosions. Either the ones you remember or the ones you anticipate see the former. It paralyzes. You live in life in a rear view mirror, driving full speed across six lanes of traffic into the center divider, or so shell-shocked, you too stupid to duck when bullets are flying. Or the latter, your life, a game of capture the flag. So fixated on the finish line, you stepped right on a landmine, frustrated because you can't find your keys. Think about the traffic you finna sit in and the meetings you about to miss to realize you've been holding your keys the whole time. Slow down. You've been hypnotized by the possibilities. Son, I couldn't hear past the bombs. First one didn't kill me and the second one ain't even happened. Yet it ended our family. It told me a love story. This woman, born before him, he said, but I knew her from before, and at the moment of conception, there was this eternal connection. And although I didn't know it then, I fight for her affection. It's this war we've been waging since day one of creation. And only when you lose her, do you learn to appreciate her. Like even when I'm with her, I'm itching to get rid of her. And she only gives you one shot. Blow it and she's gone. I took advantage of her. That's why I'm telling you that son, you can't rush her or slow her down. You better keep her on your side. She will slip through your fingers like sand. Her name is time. And he told me a secret. He said, multitasking, it's a myth. You're not doing anything good, just a lot of stuff awful. And she begged me to stop stretching her thin and stuffing her full and stop being so concerned with the old her and future her, love her. Now, now, so the presence was God's present, and you should be that present. So I guess you can say I've, I've somewhat been through a divorce, I'm no longer married to my phone. <laughs> Learning to be here now. Thank you very much, guys. This morning, I want to challenge you to listen to the wisdom of James. Stop planning for your prosperity and count the cost of following Christ. Stop looking to the future you wish would come and instead be present in the moments we're in. It is now that we have an opportunity to meet in the presence of Jesus. It is now that he is with us, wanting us to focus ourselves around him, to say, maybe if it's God's will, he will lead us forward into the next day. But either way, I'm going to be with him. I pray that, that you can change your perspective and that I can change mine so that we might be in tune with God's leading and quit building our storehouses for ourselves.
Here at First Baptist, we believe in prayer, and we believe in praying for each other. We believe that God listens to us, that our prayers are like a pleasing aroma to our God, and, and so we come to him in prayer for each other, for the world, um, and to thank him for what he's doing in us. And so this is our opportunity to pray. And I know we're not all together in one place, and it doesn't quite always feel the same, and we may not be able to tell each other the, the various needs that we have or that we know about. But thankfully, God knows all, right? And he is with us together this morning. So I want to take a moment and just open uh, a space for us to pray. And I, I invite you to lead that prayer um, because you there can, can, uh, can lift up your words and your hearts to God in heaven. So as we think about the, a worldwide pandemic, as we think about uh, protests and unrest around our country, as we think about um, persecution in other countries around the world of, of believers, and when we think about uh, the, the great needs all around us, as we think about our church family that are sick and that are hurting, those that are, are uh, lonely and afraid and in need of comfort. Let's go to the Lord and offer to him our prayers. Let's ask him to be with us in this time. Let's pray. Once again, I want to thank you for uh, being a part of our worship time, and uh, our hope is that that you feel the presence of, of Christ when when we worship, even even through a TV or a phone or a computer, uh, and uh, and that you are uh, encouraged and as we go forward throughout our week. Today, I uh, just want to remind you that. That we are here for you, and if you have needs, please let us know. Please get in touch with us here at, at the church, and uh, I would love to, to be able to reach out to you uh, to help out in any way that we might be able to do so. We do have our parking lot pantry that continues to get tons of traffic. If you have needs for food, please come and take some. If you have the opportunity or the ability to bring food, that's a constant need as uh, we cycle through uh, that, that pantry food very consistently. So. If you're able, come and bring some and be a part of that as well. We also want to remind you that uh, we continue to, uh, to do the work of the church, even though we're not fully back in all areas. And so if you would like to continue to, to support that ministry, you can do so by, um, sit, by sending an offering to our church at uh, P.O. Box 245, Gardner, Kansas, 66030. 
or you can do it online at, at uh, Easy Tithe, and there's an app for that in your app store. Look up First Baptist Church of Gardner. You can find it, or go to our website at gardnerfirstbaptist.com and uh, click on pay, uh, Give Online. Anyway, we're, we're grateful that you've been with us, and we hope that uh, you will continue to see God at work all around you in the days ahead. Have a great week.